Hi there, I'm Anthony Chung and I'm the Head of Market Analysis here at Amplify Trading. Every weekday morning I'll deliver a fundamental rundown ahead of the European Open. But if you subscribe to the channel, you'll also get content from the rest of the team. So, let's begin. Okay, very good morning to everyone. Hope you're doing well and had a great weekend. It's Monday the 19th of October, just coming up to 7am here in London and giving you your regular look ahead for the week as well as encapsulating all the weekend news and certainly quite a few things for me to get you up to speed on from stimulus talks to Chinese GDP overnight and things like earnings, COVID, Brexit. Um, so what I'm going to, what my intention is to do is I'm just going to give you a brief overview of just general market sentiment here on the charts this morning and then I'll go straight into the headlines and get you ready for what you can expect from the session ahead. Uh, so overall, risk appetite moderately high. Uh, US index futures, NASDAQ's up 100 already, the S&P 24, the DAX up 27 points. This coming after generally a, a positive Asia Pacific session in terms of the equity markets uh, across that continent. A uh, combination really of things, mainly the factors I'll describe in a moment, some progression or at least commitment to continue dialogue on the US stimulus front between the US House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and the Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin uh, is underpinning general sentiment. Um, but as I said, we'll go into the details in a, in a moment. Otherwise, the COVID cases still definitely need to be tracked on a global level. There's a couple of charts I'm going to show you. Uh, overall hospitalizations pretty much across the board going up and particularly in the US albeit at a fairly gradual pace but just given the nervousness that was apparent at the end of last week uh, pertaining to the Midwest in the US there was nothing kind of shocking that developed I would say uh, over the weekend but certainly it's going to be something to keep an eye on as we go through the rest of the uh, the week. So in terms of the other asset classes in the currency markets the dollars just edged a little lower as UK European participants have come into the market and so consequently just a slight uplift seen in euro dollar and cable both of which trade broadly flat at the moment so despite all of the Brexit headlines that we've had um, at the end of last week about Boris Johnson being quite let's say assertive and walking away from the deal or looking for an Australian style trade deal um, none of that downside was really sustained as we were expecting uh, at the time and we were commenting on the fact that a lot of this seen as more political posturing than any real definitive end date which we as we know legally uh, is not seen until the end of the year when the end of transition um, so a few things UK wise as well that have been going on uh, that I'll update you on but otherwise with some of that touch of dollar weakness as uh, European participants have come in gold's just seen a, a slight uptick uh, we've just broken out of the Asia Pacific range, which was also capped by the pivot level in the futures market. So trading now at 1912, up about six bucks. Uh, elsewhere, then with the positive general tone in the equity index futures, T notes down about four ticks, uh, trading at 138.30. Uh, similar loss seen in the boom this morning with a slight moderate gap down, uh, trading below its pivot in the futures. Uh, and WCI crew is pretty flat at the moment. However, there is an OPEC plus JMMC meeting happening today that you need to be aware of. All right, well, look, let's get into the, the nitty gritty and, and get you up to speed. First off, before I go into the US stimulus talks, overnight you did have the release of Chinese GDP. Um, wasn't really too much of a market mover in all honesty in terms of the local assets and the Chinese Yuan. Uh, Chinese GDP came in year on year at 4.9%. was a touch softer than expected, 52 you also had Chinese retail sales come in almost double consensus at 3.3% and industrial output was at 6.9% above the expected 58 So perhaps a, a touch soft on the GDP, but quite a bit firm on retail sales and IP um, in the overnight session. But again, overall reaction relatively tame, but certainly that data not enough to detract uh, away from the more positive commitments that we've had on Capitol Hill in regards to uh, pursuing talks on on stimulus and this then brings us to this article here so what's the latest well Nancy Pelosi has set a Tuesday deadline for more progress with the White House on fiscal stimulus before the US election of course on the 3rd of November uh, on Saturday Trump said he would exceed the amounts floated so far 
and voiced confidence that he could quickly convince Republicans to back a good deal. So as we were talking about on the political side last week, Trump's quite forthcoming now uh, in moving more towards the Democratic demand for a higher fiscal stimulus kind of bill amount. Uh, and this is strategically very important because when we look at the polls in a moment, uh, it's particularly sensitive timing because of the fact that Florida um, ballot voting opens today. And that's one of the most important ones in terms of the size of electoral college seats, which at 29 uh, is tied with New York for the third largest behind that of California and Texas. Uh, and Florida is always seen as the tipping point as one of the most important battlegrounds that might determine the election. And so I would expect Trump to continue to be saying these types of comments because he needs to kind of get in the heads of those voters right now, not just waiting for the 3rd of November, of course, uh, because uh, it's going to be decisive from this point onwards. Um, so the latest then, given this kind of commitment to try and get something done, according to Pelosi, in the coming days, um, both Pelosi and the Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin uh, spoke at length apparently on Saturday night. I think the call was just over an hour and 15 minutes or so. Obviously, people in markets looking at the individual minutes of how long they speak as toward how progressive they are. Because sometimes when there's an abrupt kind of end to a meeting, markets can take that quite negatively. But apparently the two were, uh, were in dialogue. And this obviously uh, is important in that sense that they're going to be speaking again today. So it's definitely something to be to be on the watch out for. Uh, one would think that that's going to come stateside timing, so towards the latter part of the European afternoon, if you're looking out for that type of thing. But yeah, the crescendo of those talks and general optimism or pessimism, which might play out in negative positive market movement, might well come by tomorrow for that self-imposed deadline put forward by Nancy Pelosi. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, it really is quite key at the moment because the early voting in Florida has opened. Uh, as I mentioned, Florida is really quite a pivotal area. And looking at uh, a couple of things, first of all, from a nationwide uh, RCP national average polling, um, Biden still has a fairly commanding lead of about 8.9 points. Uh, in the battleground areas now, uh, Biden leads by 4.3 points. Now, these, these numbers still heavily in his favour, but actually they have narrowed ever so slightly, as you can see here by the um, convergence of these two blue and red lines here. Now, in particular, we were just talking about the importance of Florida. Uh, that is probably of this list of key battlegrounds, the singular most important, just given the size of those electoral college votes. And that one, you'll notice, is the closest. Biden only leads, so even on a national front, he's ahead by you know, almost nine points. In Florida, he's ahead by just over one point. Uh, so worth bearing this in mind, because really the balance of power does reside with a lot of these key areas. Uh, and as far as uh, Trump's movements are concerned, Trump will be visiting Arizona today, which we'll see as one of these key areas, and Biden currently ahead by 3.9. And that comes after he held a campaign rally in Nevada uh, yesterday on Sunday, so still super busy uh, on that front trying to campaign to get as, as much in as possible before the uh, the deadline, which is only, of course, around two weeks or so now. Um, moving from there onto the COVID situation, uh, first of all, I thought we'd have a look at the, uh, the US. And I know there's a couple of graphics on my screen here, uh, but I guess the one I wanted to, to show you is this one here on the right hand side. And this is looking at the contrasting experiences of the pandemic in the US. And these lines would indicate a seven day rolling average of new deaths per 100,000. But the colors depict then the differences between uh, this, this kind of deep red color, which is large inner cities, and the lighter blue colors are rural, small towns or cities. And so, uh, obviously, big U.S. cities and their suburbs, particularly New York, they suffered the tri-state area the most back in kind of March, April time when the pandemic first hit. Whereas now, what's happening in America is very much more so uh, COVID-19 deaths we're looking at here uh, have been occurring at a greater rate in small town and rural counties than in cities. So there has been a bit of a change in terms of the composition uh, as well about how this virus has been um, acting as time has gone on and overall national hospitalization rates in the US are gradually ticking up 
uh, at the moment. So again, from a market's point of view, uh, those numbers definitely warrant monitoring and, and, and remaining quite vigilant for if that curve starts to become steeper on hospitalizations and, and consequently deaths will start to move higher. And that can, could make markets a little bit more apprehensive. And then if this talk on Capitol Hill is just pure political gamesmanship to try and make it appear that each side's doing as much as they can without either side really coming to any real concession and compromise, then a lack of stimulus, if those numbers go up, could be something to look out for this week uh, that could uh, take hold in a negative fashion in asset classes as the, as the week goes on. Um, Elsewhere then, talking about the broader global situation with COVID, again focusing on this chart on the right hand side, I know it's a bit small so I'll walk you through it, uh, but here what we're looking at is the likes of, uh, you've got Austria, well if I go through it, you've got Austria, Belgium, Czech, Denmark, Finland, France, so on and so forth. Now what this is looking at here is patients in hospital with COVID-19 per 100,000 uh, and of all of these nations, You've got Belgium, Czech Republic, uh, Finland, France, Ireland, Italy, Portugal, and the UK are all seeing uh, increases in the outbreak accelerating, resulting in patients in hospital at this present point in time. So herein then lies the, the, the issue about all of the restrictions that we were saw being put in place across mainland Europe, predominantly in the UK last week, and certainly that's still uh, quite a sensitive area that I would suggest to continue to monitor uh, as we continue to go forward. On the front of the UK COVID side of things, still mounting pressure of course on Boris Johnson. Uh, Britain needs to impose a three-week period of a national lockdown restrictions immediately in order to stop cases of COVID-19 spir spiralling out of control, according to a government scientific advisor Jeremy Farrar said at the weekend, adding that current regional measures would not be effective. Uh, this is talking about that current regional focus tiering system that we, we have in place at the moment. Um, that idea though of a kind of circuit breaker of three weeks was ruled out by Senior Minister Michael Gove, who is doing the kind of media rounds uh, on Sunday. But again, uh, timing wise, definitely this has been around the muted time before of when a circuit breaker could take place and certainly uh, what will dictate whether that course of action becomes a necessity for Johnson where he would run out of wiggle room would be if these COVID case numbers start translating into increased hospitalizations and deaths. And if that does happen this week, then certainly there is a tangible prospects of an increasing up the scale of tiering system to the point of nation nationwide lockdown. And if that does occur, of course, that would be uh, very much a negative for, for the British pound. I was looking at the numbers, I think, last week i think it's something like the impact of a week shutdown is something i think i'm right in saying it's something like circa 20 billion for the uk economy so obviously every week in which that happens compounds then the negative impact it would have consequently the more uh, weight it would create uh, as a negative for, for the british pound but we're not there yet and obviously it's contingent very much on how the virus behaves going forward moving on then with the uk let's stick with that and let's talk a little bit about brexit um, yeah, last week I thought was um, very much politics playing out uh, and, and hopefully some of the um, the kind of insight that we gave on the channel hopefully was useful uh, to you guys last week because even though there was a, a, a knee-jerk reaction, markets in the intraday do tend to be very sensitive uh, and so as some of these headlines were coming out, particularly from the UK side being quite aggressive of uh, a tangible risk of walking away definitively from the deal. The pound did blip, but nearly every blip was counteracted by quite a steep, sharp and quick recovery. Um, and this week, what you're looking out for really is conversations on negotiations, obviously to continue in earnest to try and get forward some sort of deal. Uh, this coming uh, irrespective of the kind of fairly sour note that things ended last week. Now, one thing that a lot of the papers are looking at this morning, particularly Bloomberg here, you can see in this article, is the internal market bill, which really caused quite a, was the trigger point of one of the, the main points of, um, of turning south in, in cable in the currency pair about two or three weeks ago, was when the UK introduced this internal market bill, uh, which was kind of like the planning if they don't actually go ahead and do a deal and so on. 
and that actual bill begins its progress through the House of Lords um, from today. Now, as you will know, the, the way the structure works is the, the Commons, uh, this, this has already been done, but then it needs to go through the House of Lords to be ratified then into UK law. And the problem is, is that the Lords are inherently more sided with being um, kind of pro-Remain rather than Brexit in terms of their political disposition, even though that shouldn't really play too much of an issue. The idea here being that legislators uh, are unlikely to reject the draft law entirely. I mean, that would be unconstitutional if you want to call it that, because that has been what's been passed in the lower house. But that does not mean that they cannot make amendments to the existing bill. And the point here being that they're almost certain to take out some of the most controversial parts um, of that bill in the weeks ahead in a move then that could really um, revive some of these failing talks with the EU because the EU will see that as a more positive step if they water down that internal market bill according to people familiar with the matter. Uh, so something to just bear in mind. Um, the other thing that we did have at the end uh, of last week, you might have missed it, I don't think it's particularly important, but just so you're aware of it, Moody's, the rating agency, did downgrade the UK on Friday to AA3 to AA2. Uh, they cited a huge economic hit from the coronavirus, Brexit, and the lack of clear budget plans from Prime Minister Boris Johnson's government as the key metrics then for the reason why they've been downgraded. And I think on an equivalent country basis now, we're level with the likes of the Czech Republic and Belgium as a reference point. Um, I know a, a sovereign being downgraded might sound quite a scary headline, um, but with things like Brexit, coronavirus, um, yeah, agreed. I think Rishi Sunak has delayed and pushed back the budget, but I guess it's almost inevitable that was going to happen because of this such unclear uncertainty over the COVID. I don't think that's too surprising either. So I think the market can take that downgrade in its stride. Uh, and as you're seeing resulting in prices this morning, there's been no real reaction to that news. So context is super important when we're talking about these types of uh, individual headlines. Um, then I'm going to move over to, to this chap uh, from the Bank of England side of things. And this will bring us into a number of central bank speakers that are speaking this week. But from the BOE side, it's going to be particularly busy. Now, Bailey, the governor, did speak at the weekend. And he said there is significant risk of further disappointments to UK economic growth and that the country faced unprecedented uncertainty as coronavirus cases begin to climb again. So pretty pessimistic coming out from the, uh, the governor. Now, the pound hasn't really reacted to this. Um, but what I would say is that um, the next Bank of England meeting is only just under three weeks away. Uh, so shortly after the US election. And this week, we've got Governor Bailey speaking again on Thursday. We've got other policymakers, Broadbent, Cunliffe, they're speaking later on today. You've got uh, Sir Dave Ramsden speaking on, on Friday. So you've got all the deputy governors as well as the governor himself coming out speaking this week. And this is going to be one of the last opportunities, really, for members to flag whether the MPC is likely to announce more stimulus measures in November, including raising the level of asset purchases. If you remember, a few weeks ago, it was really November that was penciled in as the key month which the Bank of England could look to accelerate their asset purchase program. Remember, even though there's been a lot of conversation about negative rates, if they were to even happen at all, which in this case is still a low probability, although it's been tabled, that's probably not going to happen till further out in the future. The next logical sequence is to rearm the, the kind of amount of available um, space on their asset purchase program. Um, so at the moment, it's still a bit uncertain whether that's going to materialise or not. Obviously, with Brexit, it might be even we get to early parts of November and we're no, no, none the wiser as far as where these discussions are. So at that point, it's a bit difficult for the Bank of England to make a judgment call on do they increase now, do they wait, if they increase, by how much. And then with things like coronavirus, obviously, that we should be in a little bit of a more... Uh, of a better idea about this latest kind of pickup of what the kind of trajectory of rates looks like then as to um, trying to understand as market participants the likelihood of the Bank of England taking action. So all of those things would be the, the specific ways in which I'd monitor the, the, those uh, prospects. However, commentary, of course, from the NPC members, given the frequency that they're speaking and the importance of the individuals that are speaking, 
Um, I think this could be quite a key thing to monitor as we go through the week. Um, from a Bank of England speaker point of view, we also have economic data as well. CPI comes out in the UK on Wednesday. Um, price pressures in part will likely be a product of the curtailment of the government's eat out to help out scheme. So the removal of that, meaning prices are going to jump back up again, should CP, P, uh, CPI move up just a touch uh, with less of a drag from clothing and footwear also set to bolster uh, UK CPI. So when that comes out, if it does see an uptick, I don't think it's a massive surprise to, to markets. Okay, um, one of the other headlines that I thought I'd, I'd share and it's relevant for today is to do with OPEC and that's because um, OPEC plus a meeting today, the group meeting to take stock amid an accelerating pandemic we're seeing globally at the moment and a couple of things to be aware of, no supply decisions are expected formally from OPEC plus until December the 1st. However, reports at the weekend were suggesting that leading members Saudi Arabia and Russia are already stepping up diplomacy. Now, what people are speculating at the moment is Vladimir Putin and Mohammed bin Salman have spoken twice by phone in a week last week. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but actually it's the first time the two countries' leaders have spoken so frequently since the depths of the oil crisis that we experienced back in April. And you remember April, May is when we had that period briefly of the negative price in the futures contracts, uh, when we had complete demand kind of destruction on the back of the most stringent global uh, lockdown measures. Um, last week, just to get up to speed, the OPEC Secretary General, um, he said demand is, quote, anemic. Uh, and obviously this comes in the context of uh, continued rising of COVID, which is resulting in more restrictions, which of course is impeding demand very much so. And then OPEC's own internal report pointed to the risk of a new surplus in oil. Uh, and in private, delegates admit they're open to delaying the increase when a formal decision is taken in six weeks' time. So we're already six weeks out from when they're going to make the next kind of uh, decrease in the stringency of these uh, these cuts, remember we've gone from around a, a supply cut of 9.6 million for a number of months. We've eased that to around 7.7 .7 million. It was supposed to be a, st a kind of staggered approach back to normal normalization as the demand curve continues to improve as the economic recovery takes hold. But the problem is that shape of recovery continues to falter. And so therefore OPEC already looking, I feel, in almost like a central bank-esque way trying to manipulate market thinking that they could well just keep things as they are and in a sense then that would be um, kind of controlling the supply a little more so for a little longer in order to just keep an underlying hand of support in the marketplace so they are meeting today i would definitely keep an eye out for any any comments there oil's pretty quiet as far as the overnight session is concerned but could be something we'll get some headlines on a little bit later and then looking at earnings uh, we had all the bank earnings, of course, um, last week. We've got 96 of the S&P 500 reporting this week, so things start to step up a little bit. We've got eight of the Dow 30 components also reporting. Uh, just looking at the highlights here, not going to go into any real detail. Uh, as you can see, you've got IBM aftermarket today, one of the bigger market cap names. Uh, Tuesday highlights, you've got P&G pre-market, Netflix aftermarket. Um, before market open on Wednesday, you've got likes of Verizon, uh, Thermo Fisher, Biogen, aftermarket Tesla, of course, which will generate, I'm sure, lots of headlines. Thursday, pre-market Coca-Cola, AT&T, some of the airline firms, American Airlines, Southwest, and so on, of course, will be interesting. And then aftermarket, you've got Intel. And then at the end of the week on Friday, Amex, probably one of the bigger names to, to be aware of. Okay. Quick look at the calendar then, and that will incorporate then the final few points I wanted to make. And first off is the just volume of central bank speakers this week. Uh, it continues to be pretty incredible. Uh, from across the board, I've already talked about the Bank of England. The Federal Reserve is exactly the same. We've got Christine Lagarde talking again today as well as the Chief Economist Philip Lane. They're both speaking, um, not only Lagarde today, but both of those two individuals speaking on Wednesday also. So for me, why are central bankers speaking so much? Well, I just think there's a lot of there's a lot to track on the global macro front at the moment. So there's a lot potentially that investors could become nervous about, particularly in a pandemic environment. So for me, 
this is a probably coordinated effort on behalf of all of the central banks to be as reassuring to markets as possible, hence the frequency and the volume of speakers that we're seeing at the moment. Uh, today is, is, is a busy one. Um, you've got Jerome Powell, the Fed Chair, speaks uh, at the IMF panel on a cross-border payment conference. Uh, Lagarde speaking at 1.30, Powell's at 1, uh, and then Lagarde giving more opening remarks at 1.45. You can see you've got the Bank of England Deputy Governor Broadbent, he'll be at 1.45, and then you've got a host of Fed speakers as well in the late afternoon in early evening uh, as well to be aware of. Uh, but as you go through the week, you can see there's more Fed speakers on Tuesday, again, afternoon based. Uh, you've got Lagarde and Lane, the chief economist, speaking late 5 p.m. Uh, on Wednesday, London time. Bank of England governor then comes uh, again on Thursday morning. Uh, and then you've got the deputy governor, Ramsden, speaking in the afternoon on Friday as well. Just while we're here on the calendar on the Friday, that's one of the most important days uh, that we'll get from a data perspective because that's when we're going to get the Eurozone UK PMI numbers. These are the October preliminary figures. Expectations are that manufacturing will still outperform so ever so slightly on a relative basis, but services take a bigger hit. Social distancing measures continuing to tighten is likely to impede that particular side of things. Um, also on Friday, um, I say it's Friday, really this is Thursday night in the US, but it's the early hours, 2 a.m., going into Friday morning, if you're in London, we get the final, what should be, presidential debate in Nashville. Um, so as far as I'm aware, that's still going ahead, um, but look out for any changes to that, just given, of course, uh, some of the delays that we've had or, or cancellations given the COVID situation with the president. But if that does go ahead, that is the final opportunity then for them to go head to head in a televised format. The other thing on a data perspective, I want to mention uh, just going into the beginning of the week, and I guess going into Wednesday, I mentioned the UK CPI already. You do have, if you're looking at the Australian dollar, the Antipodean currencies, uh, RBA governor's low hint about an extension of bond purchase programs to longer maturities has prompted many to think that the RBA move will come at their 3rd of November policy meeting in terms of more easing. Remember, he talked about buying longer dated maturities in their bond buying program and even that there's room to, to lower rates further. And the reason why that's important is that this week we might get more clarity because we'll get the RBA minutes on Tuesday uh, and then a speech by Deputy Governor De Belli, um is, is going to happen as well this week. Uh, also, you remember last week the increase in heightened Australian-Chinese trade tensions, specifically around the idea of China banning Australian coal imports. And as I said at the time, um, the Aussie is particularly sensitive to that type of rhetoric, uh, given the trade dependency that they have on their largest trading partner, which is China. Uh, so keep an eye on that uh, as well. Um, that is pretty much everything. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, so lots to, to think about for the week ahead from a fundamental perspective. Uh, overall, the key things to watch, I think, for today to just get things up and running uh, is going to be uh, a lot of key central bank speaking, uh, predominantly based in the second half of the day in the afternoon. You've got Jerome Powell and Christine Lagarde, as well as BOE and Fed members speaking. Any updates on Pelosi and Mnuchin, so keep an eye probably in the afternoon and early evening London time for any uh, updates as per Pelosi and Mnuchin commentary. Uh, and then, yeah, the campaign trail continues in earnest and particular eyes on some of the, the, the key battleground states. And I'm sure Trump will continue as ever to be as vocal uh, with his tweets as we go through the day. But I'm going to leave it at that. That's your, your rundown for the week ahead. Hope it was useful. Any commentary at all, or any comments, I should say, uh, feel free to drop a comment. And don't forget to um, like and subscribe to the channel. I'd really appreciate it. And I'll see you guys tomorrow. All right. Have a good day.